Greetings, metalheads and monster fans. We're back braving the haunted halls of the Los Angeles Theater to bring you another episode of Metal and Monsters. And as you can see, it's our favorite time of year. The spirits are restless, and the heavy metal gods have summoned us to celebrate Halloween in true headbanging fashion. Not only are these two artists complete masters of their craft, but they happen to know a little bit about each other too, which should make for a fun evening. Tonight we'll be joined by the amazing Bill Mosley and the Fast and Furious John Five. But before we shred the night away, let's turn up the volume and raise the dead with some tunes from the crypt. How can you describe the sounds of Los Angeles throughout the 1980s? Heavy metal, glam, hard rock? Make your own call. But what we do know is that the hair was high and the headbangers dressed in sharp, shiny leather, kicking crowds in the teeth to clear the way for that one big shot at stardom. Our friends at Numero Group have recently put together an amazing release featuring 21 tracks by 21 of the Sunset Strip's most razor sharp heathens. Bound for Hell details and oozes the 1980s LA rock scene in its truest form, featuring tracks by Black and Blue, Leather Angel, Odin, and Max Havoc. Not only that, the set also features a 144 page hardbound book detailing all the chaos from the height of the Sunset Strip era. Now for your chance to win, all you have to do is send your name, email, and mailing address to Metal and Monsters, that's P.O. Box 70191, Pasadena, California, home of Van Halen, 91117. The winners will be selected random and announced on Gibson TV at a later date. Now coming up next, we'll be joined by my good friends, John Five and actor Bill Mosley. So stick around. The track springs open. Releases a night of rat and roll. October 7th at the Providence Civic Center. Frank J. Russo presents Rat. Center box office, all ticket trot locations are charged through Teletron. 1 800 382 8080. October 7th, Providence Civic Center. Rat. Welcome back, you maniacs. Oh my God, we have such a special show today. You're not gonna believe who's on stage together at the same time once again. Mr. John Five and Mr. Bill Mosley. I believe you two have met before. I am a huge Mosley fan, not just the films, but the music as well. That's right. I believe you're also both Buckethead appreciators. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> That's right. Have you guys ever bonded over Buckethead? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we've talked. We've talked Buckethead. You yeah. made records with Buckethead. I did. A plethora did. of records. Basically five. It's a lot of records. Five. That's a lot of records. Yes, but then it but it kind of morphed into ten because I kept kind of reissuing. <laughs> and mixing the songs. Nice. <laughs> Which I have all of the uh, records, I'm Thank proud you. to say. Corn Bugs. Yep, Corn Bugs. Yeah, yeah you're an avid Buckethead collector. You have, yeah. you have everything. Right? I don't have everything because there's a cornucopia of music. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but he's, he's putting, he's put out like over 100 CDs maybe. More well over 100. Well yeah. over 100. Yeah. That's right. But, there's a bunch of like one-off stuff too. Yeah, there's yeah. some that's just like noise. Right. And then there's some that are like the alphabet that like record A, B, C, D, right, all right. that stuff. Yeah. Right. But the corn bug stuff is great. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. So I want to get a little background on both of you guys on why you got into show business. What was <laughs> what was the hook? It's it's a great question. It's such a hard question to 
answer because it kind of just something triggers in your head. And for me, it was, you know, just like anybody was just glued in front of the TV. And I saw like anything that had music, like the monkeys, uh, the Brady Bunch, Happy Days, anything like that. But Hee Haw was really the thing that like made me go, whoa, this is like insane. And there was a little boy on, uh, on Hee Haw and he was the banjo champion of 1976. And that's what made me go, and it just was a, you know, light bulb that went off in my head. And ever since then, you know, I picked up a guitar and I was just obsessed with doing, pushing things to the limit, if you will. Roy yeah. Clark. Roy Clark, yeah. not, Buck an Owens. amazing guitar Buck Owens. player. Yeah. yeah. Buck yeah. Owens, wow. Buck Owens, yeah, everybody was on that show. And everybody who was anybody was on that show. Yeah. Everybody was on that show. Johnny Cash and even Katie Lang was on the show. It's it's funny to watch those now because as a kid you didn't really understand, but they were all drunk. <laughs> and they loved it cuz they would like laugh and they would mess up and they'd like giggle and stuff like that. Um, but grandpa and string bean and, you know, all those guys, it was just, it's funny to watch nowadays. Cause you're like, that, that guy's totally wasted. <laughs> yeah. Bill, your turn. <laughs> um, well, I grew up in Northern Illinois, Barrington, Illinois. Uh, my dad was a war hero, all American football player, hunter, skier. So he was, uh, it's a pretty hard-ass guy except for Halloween and uh, Halloween he was very creative he would uh, take us little kids to uh, like the local cemetery and have us get out of the car and do grave rubbings and unbeknownst to us he would have called the cops and the cruiser would show up in the cemetery this happened once actually and all of a sudden the lights went on and you know the the red bubble was going and, you know, we were, you know, 11 years old, <laughs> like totally frightened. Uh, so dad was, well, he was sadistic, I guess. And so that's some amazing. Respects. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we would always have fun on Halloween. So, you know, monsters for me was always, you know, good, a good thing in the house. Um, and I used to get up and, uh, and really, uh, risk the wrath of my parents. I would get up at midnight on Saturday nights in Illinois with something called uh, Shock Theater. Mm -hmm. And it was like the local horror host. And uh, I would watch horror movies. That was my favorite thing. The beginning of the end, the giant grasshoppers and yeah. Last Man on Earth and all kinds of cool, mostly black and white movies. Um, and that just kind of, you know, that gave me my horror start. But, you know, the way I grew up, I um, that was always considered an avocation. Mm -hmm. There was never really a sense that that could be a career. Mm -hmm. At the tender age of 36, I landed the part of uh, Chop Top in Texas Chainsaw 2. Changed my life, and, um, and I found out that not only could you do something cool like that, act in horror movies, which was really, you know, a dream, but not necessarily a goal. Um, but then I found out you could actually make a, a decent living at it. So, you know, it took it took a while, but uh, I finally got here. What age did you leave Illinois? Uh, 13. Oh, my God. Wow. Yeah. Uh, my parents sent me to a uh, boarding school in Connecticut, the Hotchkiss School. And uh, so it was an all-boys boarding school, kind of like a Charles Dickens <laughs> type of boarding school. Wow. So uh, I was there for, uh, you know, four years and then uh, uh, ended up at uh, Yale and uh, was there for four years. And after that, I was like, no more school. Thank you. Yale. Uh, right. Jeez. No, right. <laughs> Yale. <laughs> Tell me how you discovered monsters. Like, what was your introduction into? Um, I remember it uh, just like the horror host. I had we had Sir Graves Gastly. I was you know, obsessed. And I was so young. I was so, so little. And I would always just watch these movies and I'd be glued to it. And I would get famous monsters magazines. I would put my magazines out on the green shag carpet and watch, um, these movies with Sir Graves. And then I would wait for the Abbott and Costello. Cause those were on Sunday morning. I was waiting for the, you know, I love those mummy and the, the meets Frankenstein, the Wolfman. 
before that, I was in kindergarten and I would go up and I could picture this perfectly. I went to Mare School and there were three flights. It was this beautiful old school, gorgeous. Would walk up to the library and they had these Crestwood uh, books mm -hmm. and they were orange and they had, you know, every monster, you know, the, all the classics. And I would check them out every day, every day, every day. And my mom, and I was so little, but my mom was so kind, she ordered the books for me. And I, just, and I still have them. But that was my very first introduction, like the Sir Graves and the Famous Monsters and the Crestwood books. And uh, it's funny, something when you're so small, so little, that just sticks in your brain. And all these things when we were so young are still with us today that are so important. Right. You know? Yeah. It's kind of like if we walked around with our whoobies still. Yeah, right. You know? It'd be weird, but we kind of still do, you know? Well, it's funny you mention that because that's really the impetus of this show is one big whoobie. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, that's that was that's, that was going to be the name of the show. One big whoopie. Yeah, got one shot big down. Whoopie. Did, like <laughs> Didn't go over so well in the meeting, but uh, right. You know, it looks great on a shirt. Right. No, it, it looked good on the blanket. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny too because um, there's a sense that, like, I was into monsters and dinosaurs as a kid, and there's a sense that a lot of people then outgrow that. Uh, but uh, you know, for some of us. You know, we, uh, you know, we were somehow figured out a way to, you know, keep loving them. Um, and that, that to me is a real, but, you know, I consider that a victory. Completely. You know? <laughs> yeah. Right. I, I mean, I. St I'm still into it. Yeah. 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 I still do the same exact things that I do when I was 10. Play guitar, watch monster movies, <laughs> talk about Kiss with my friends. Yeah. I mean. I still do the exact same things, you know? Except yeah. for pay taxes. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> don't do that. You did when you were a kid. Right, right. I had a hard oh, line. I had a hard line. <laughs> Very strict. You went to KISS College, right? Yeah, I went to, I was, uh, you know, he went to Yale. I was part of the KISS Army. <laughs> awesome. Is that is that what turned you to the dark side, so to speak, from Roy Clark to... It, it was. It, I remember walking through Sears, and I at this time, you know, I loved monsters before music. Yeah. And I was so into monsters, and I was walking through Sears, and it was spring 77. That's when Love Gun came out. And there was a big <laughs> Love Gun display. And I was like, oh. And they were playing the music and stuff like that. And I was like, can I please have this record? My mom was so cool. She was like, oh, absolutely. Bought me the record. Wow. And it was like monsters with guitars yeah. and headphones on my big, crazy seventies headphones, listening to the record. And my mom used to eat cow's tongue all the time. She loved cow's tongue. So she had this cow's tongue and put ketchup on it and then went ah, to me. And, <laughs> and I got so scared cause I had my headphones on, <laughs> but I remember that. And I was like, but that was my introduction to kiss was Mom that rules. that's amazing yeah. yeah it's so funny bill was there an actor that you saw or what like what was the, what got what what acting bug bit you and when like where did you think was there somebody that you looked up to did you have a, a, a kiss type hero with acting you know i mean i've always loved gregory peck so i oh. suppose you know if especially as Captain Ahab and uh, Moby Dick. So anyway, but that's, um, you know, when I was a kid um, in my little town, we had something called the Barrington Play Reading Group, which was a bunch of parents that um, loved to act as an avocation. And once every couple of months, a family would donate their living room and their, um, you know, have a dinner party and then turn the living room into a stage set and stage different plays. I was drafted um, to be the kid in certain plays. Like I was in A Thousand Clowns in the Lottery and Sunrise at Campobello. Wow. Um, so that kind of got me into it. Interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, I certainly loved, you know, Bella Lugosi and, you know, Boris Karloff and Peter Lorre. Yeah. But uh, Gregory was my, my main guy. Wow. 
so cool. glad to finally welcome him to the horror community with the omen so right <laughs> right <laughs> yeah he was good in that he was right. great in that yeah oh yeah he's amazing with that we'll be right back with john and bill stick around <laughs> You know what time it is, everybody? It's Fang Mail time. One of my favorite parts of the show. Today, we have a letter from Susan. And Susan says, Hi, Count D. I love your show. Thank you. I love it, too. What, in your opinion, is the horror film with the best sequel? This is a fantastic question. A little bit of a weird one. But when I was 15, I was obsessed with The Exorcist. And I couldn't wait for the third Exorcist movie to come out. I'd already read the book and I was ready to go see it opening day. I sat through it three times in one day, but I even found The Exorcist 3 on uh, the cover of Fangoria, which came out when the movie came out. This is how obsessed with it I was. An interesting fact about this movie is it was directed by William Peter Blatty, who wrote the original novel for the first movie, The Exorcist. So when he came in to direct the third movie, which was plagued with all kinds of weird production problems, tied it to the first movie, tied in all the characters, George C. Scott, Brad Dourif, and has two really weird cameos by Patrick Ewing and Fabio. Do not watch it with a date unless you want your date to pee their pants. Keep sending your letters to Metal and Monsters, Attention Fang Mail, PO Box 70191, Pasadena, California, 91117. Keep sending your letters, guys. Thank you so much. This very special Halloween edition of Terror Trek, we thought it'd be fun to hop in the Oldsmobile with the ladies and drive on down to the abandoned cabin in the middle of the woods. Maybe put on an old tape recorder and wait for some weird shit to happen. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. And on the way to beautiful downtown Burbank, we're gonna pick up my buddy John, who happens to be the installation artist for the Mystic Museum. And he's gonna walk us through the very cool Evil Dead exhibit. Props from all the movies, stuff we've never seen before and will probably never see again, directly from Sam Raimi's closet. So let's go everybody, get in the car. I am here in the Mystic Museum exhibit area with my new buddy, John. John, hi. How are you, man? Thanks for having us. Thanks for coming. What can you tell us about this building and what goes on in here? Well, this is our second location where we do a museum rotations. This time around, it's our third installation of Evil Dead. Now you are the installation expert artist. Yes, sir. Every installation that goes through these doors goes through your hands. Go through me and the two owners. Wow, awesome. So you're, you're hands on with everything in this room. Yes, sir. You know, we try to use as much actual real stuff that you'll see in movies. You know, we'll look at scenes, look at the hardware that was used. So as I'm walking through here, are there interactive parts of the exhibit or? Yeah, so there's gonna be six interactive parts where you'll put a key in and you'll get an experience out of it. What's going on in here? This is the kind of like cabin living room. Yeah, and there's the clock. There's the clock, there's the deer, there's some other horns from the movie right there. So what's going on with the box and the key and... Why don't you give it a try? Uh, do I really want to? Whoa! Somebody in there. That's the shotgun? That's the shotgun, signed by the entire cast. No shit, wow. Shotgun holster. Got sword, Polaroids taken while they're making the movie. How did these Polaroids survive like 40 years? I just don't understand. Someone must have. He's got an entire shoebox full of them. There's like a whole collage of Polaroids from them making the movie and continuity shots and everything. Yeah. So walk me through how you gather the artifacts to put in an exhibit. Where does it all come from? 
So a lot of it comes from Sam Raimi's actual storage unit. Of course, we also had pieces made and commissioned or created. So Jose Cañas that works with Sam Raimi personally went through his storage unit and found all this Evil Dead stuff in there. He's like, I shouldn't be the only one to see this. So he came to us and with the idea of doing an immersive experience. Check it out, we got more screen use props. Wow. Some from the old movie, some from the brand new movie. Holy shit, is that the actual tape recorder? That's a real deal tape recorder. No way. Linda's torso right over here. Oh man. How would you like to get your hands on a real Necronomicon? Oh my God. What? Look at that, kids. The actual Necronomicon. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Yeah. We're adults. Wow. It's a real one, so let's not read from that one. No, I won't. I can't. I won't read it. We have Ash's wristwatches here. Oh my God. Is that really Linda's head? Oh, that's her head right there in the vice. Oh, Linda. What happened to you? I always had a little bit of a thing for Linda. And Do you it, still have a thing for her now? No. Kind of just die, huh? Yeah. Look at those eyes. It's kind of insane. That's her necklace right there. Was there only one of them? There's like, that's, that's like the I one. believe so. I guess an interesting thing I always thought about the franchise is that you can clearly see, especially in the first three movies, the Three Stooges influence. You can see the slapstick kind of really make its way into the second one and, and into the third one. But, uh, it was the first time I, I saw a horror movie that could be funny. Oh yeah. And could scare the shit out of you. The perfect mixture between the two. Yeah, sure. it really, it was a, kind of the first time I'd ever seen that. And I was like, wait, is this supposed to be funny? Cause this yeah. is like the Three Stooges. Some movies did it by accident, but they did it on purpose. So a bunch of Army of Darkness helmets in here. Wow. This is one of my favorite things when we get to put these exhibits together. I like to fool around. You put these on. Why don't you try that on? Might be your size. <laughs> this is from the movie. Sure is. Hey, it fits. It's kind of my vibe. I mean, goes with everything. I remember Evil Dead 2 when the trailers started coming out. It looked like it was going to be like the bloodiest movie of the year. And my my dad took me to see Nightmare on Elm Street. I think it was Nightmare on Elm Street 3. And they had a trailer for Evil Dead 2 at the beginning of the movie. And he leaned over to me and he goes, no way. You see this one? With Ash standing on the hill. Army of Darkness. Look at that, that's so cool. More. Roll 79, frame 19. Get the level, the, the detail and the notes on everything. Yeah, you yeah. see how hard he was working there. It's definitely crazy that all this stuff still exists really and that uh, we get to display it here. I'm telling you guys, if you're a fan of this franchise, don't miss this exhibit. This is the coolest stuff. Whoa, what's going on in all here, right. John? Check it out. Screen used chainsaw, stunt chainsaw. We got the Evil Ed bus right here. So stunt chainsaw meaning that it wasn't running with an active chain on it or? Yeah, they use uh, like old CGI to move the chainsaw blade around. Wow. You can see up here on this one with those little green pieces of tape. Yeah. That's how they did that. Screen used Evil Ed too. Yes, that's his head. Evil Ed's head. Yeah, they actually let us keep that at the shop on display. So these are Army of Darkness, right? Yeah. That's the actual mechanical gauntlet. All screen used gauntlets worn by the man himself. Got more Polaroids from on set. Wow, look at that. Ash. Ash. Double-headed Ash. Double-headed Ash. Setting the scenes. We got the actual scripts here from the movies. In 1979, Renaissance Pictures, Book of the Dead, right there. Book of the Dead. That must be a first draft. Wow. Evil Dead, 1300 AD. Holy shit, John, is this what I think it is? Think it is. Ashes, actual clothes from the movie. I thought it was so cool at the end of part two, how they set it up perfectly for Army of Darkness. Like you knew he was trying oh, yeah. to travel in somewhere. You knew he was gonna wind up somewhere weird, but you didn't know what, it's, it was perfect. Perfect setup. Sam knew like at some point writing 
the series, right? That he was going to end up kind of like George Lucas knew he was going to wind up with Return of the Jedi at some point. He was going to have to tell that story. So he was getting the characters there to have that forethought and be like, OK, I'm going to send this guy to medieval times. This has been awesome. I, I can't thank you enough for yeah. walking us around. My pleasure. I still kind of want to play with Linda's head, though. Thanks for having us, John. This was awesome. My pleasure. This Thanks for hell coming. Of a, hell of a way to spend a Wednesday night in October. This is a this is a great hang. If you guys are ever in North Hollywood, Burbank area, come down to Magnolia Boulevard. This is the place for horror fans. Not only Magnolia Boulevard specifically, but the Mystic Museum is the coolest hang with all their locations now. They've got a couple of buildings exhibits like this you can walk through and fully immerse yourself and you guys are going to have a blast you're going to love it john when did you decide to make music a career and what was that like when i and i i grew up in a nice neighborhood beautiful like lived on the lake everything was nice and perfect and all that stuff but i loved playing guitar obviously and i would go to these horrible, horrible, horrible uh, clubs and they would put like a wig on me so I could get in and play and stuff like that. And I was really young, like seventh, eighth grade. And I was playing with these older dudes, you know? So it was, it was uh, really fun and exciting and all this stuff. And <laughs> the waitresses and the girls and all that stuff. I was like, whoa, this is awesome, you know? And I was this <laughs> little kid. But my parents were like, because I didn't drink or do drugs or smoke or do anything like that. But, and my parents, that's why they were allowing me to do this. But they said, as soon as you don't get up for school, you're not going to do this. Oh. So I had to get up for school every day. And that is what was my very first taste of people like applauding and, you know, mm -hmm. going, oh, cool, we like this. And I was so hooked on just playing music, but I wanted to be a session guy. I didn't, I thought it was too far, you know, my dreams didn't go that far to be a well-known musician. I can't even say rock star, but went to California and just studied every kind of music there was and started doing sessions for every TV show and every album and anything. Cause I was doing it for half the price and half of the time, you know? Mm -hmm. And everyone's like, oh, you should call this guy John. He does it for like, you know, nothing and <laughs> be done and be out of there, you know? So I was working all the time and I loved it. It was just like a drug for me, you know? And my first show, like professional thing that I did um, because I loved just doing sessions and I just wanted to be home. Lita Ford said, oh, do you want to do a, uh, some shows? She goes, we're playing with Kiss. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll be there. <laughs> uh, I'm going, you know? Wow. And ever since then, it was just, you know, I was um, on the road and just very, very thankful of everything that has happened, like this and playing all shows. I'm just, you know, still doing it. And I'm just so thankful for it, you know, every day. Bill career highlights was there was there roles that obviously chop top you mentioned earlier was a was a defining moment yes were there roles that moved the needle for you in different directions and if so what were they well certainly chop top um chop top is kind of the original fountain of my career mm -hmm. Because from Chop Top, I worked with Tom Savini, King of Splatter, who was our special effects makeup guy. And he then went on to direct the color remake of Night of the Living Dead and uh, brought me along, hired me as uh, Johnny. They're coming to get you, Bob. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then uh, from there, uh, I, I auditioned. I, I didn't even know I was auditioning for uh, Pink Cadillac, Clint Eastwood, we were just talking about. Clint, apparently, back then, didn't really like to audition people because they'd get too freaked out. It's like, oh my God, it's Clint Eastwood. Uh, so Clint liked to watch tape and his casting person showed tape of Chop Top 
from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre too. So you can just imagine Clint Eastwood sitting there watching, like, "Hey, lick That's my crazy. plate, you dog dick." You know, <laughs> I want that guy. <laughs> That's the guy. <laughs> That's him. Uh, so I got, I got hired. So I got hired for for that. Um, was there something? Was there a role you took on that ever that challenged you in some way? Um, I played Timothy Leary. Oh wow! Uh, in a play called Timothy and Charlie. Charlie being Charles Manson, played by a great actor, uh, Gil Gale. And uh, I was pretty much a two-man play. I mean, there were some, there were some uh, other characters in it, but it was basically me and Charlie side by side in uh, solitary confinement in San Quentin, which actually historically happened back in 1974. Wow. And it's just like this back and forth between, you know, Charles Manson and Timothy Leary. And it's, it was crazy. Uh, it was also the time when I first learned about the spirits of the theater. Because uh, during rehearsal, I was sitting on, there was a bed on stage, and I was sitting on the bed eating my, you know, tuna fish sandwich or whatever for lunch. And the director said, you know, you should not eat on stage. You should eat in the, in the, you know, in the seats in the audience because the stage is a sacred place. And if you respect the stage and respect the spirits of the theater, there will inevitably come a time when you will go up. You will not know the next line. And if you are right with the spirits of the theater, they will whisper it in your ear. Ah. So I got my sandwich and got up and, you know, okay. And every time we would perform Timothy and Charlie, I would, you know, take a knee and go, spirits of the theater, <laughs> you know, That's hope so we're good. And uh, there did come a time during that performance where, I couldn't remember the next line, and uh, so I started going, I just started repeating the same line over and over again, going, spirits of the theater, spirits of the theater. And, uh, you know, and I finally, it just, I finally just kicked in and, and went on. The spirits of the theater whispered that line, and on I went. So, uh, wow. and I got to say, Timothy Leary, the late Timothy Leary, showed up for maybe six or seven performances wow. really? of that little, that little play. Yeah. Six or seven, wow. Yeah, he, he loved it. Well, the spirits of the theater want us to take a break. So we'll be right <laughs> back. When we come back, we're going to do some shredding. We are here today to bear witness to the execution of Horace Pinker. He stands convicted of 52 counts of aggravated assault, 23 counts of armed robbery, and 37 counts of murder in the first degree. Prisoner, have any final words? Yeah. No more Mr. Nice Guy. I don't think he's dead. Contact. He's among you. Now, Wes Craven brings you his greatest creation. No more! Shocker. As a metal fan, when you see images of the Brooklyn Bridge, it's hard not to be reminded of the beating black heart of Typo Negative. Formed in 1989 by carnivore frontman Peter Steele, Typo Negative looked more like vampires than musicians. The band penned songs about loneliness, death, and heartbreak, all with a sound that oozed the Black Sabbath and the Beatles. Over the period of two decades, the Drab Four took us through the darker sides of life with seven studio albums that will never be forgotten. So turn on that creepy green light. This is Kenny Hickey of Typo Negative. I was born at Coney Island Hospital on the fly. My mother was in a cab. 
you know, they get more Brooklyn than that. And uh, I was raised in Marine Park, pretty poor. You know, when I look back at it now. My mother was a divorced mom, single mom, like everybody's mom was in the 70s, right? Grew up in a very small apartment, two room, one uh, living room, bedroom, and a kitchen. Slept with my brother till I was 20. Back then, you listen to the radio, WPLJ, that was the rock radio, you know? And I listened to it all day. I met this kid, Sean, in school, befriended him, and he was a big kiss fan. No, no, kiss. This guy's a horrible, they puke on stage, and I was like, well, what do you like, you know? I said, well, I like Elton John, I like this, I like that. I like this song I heard on the radio recently called uh, Rock and Roll All Night Party Over the It was just kiss, you idiot. I discovered I was a Kiss fan, you know. I went to his house. Oh, his room was great, man. I mean, his mother just let him do whatever he wanted. You know, they used to shoot BB guns into the wall. They had posters of Alice Cooper everywhere, Kiss. And within minutes, we had Kiss Alive went on. We were playing broomsticks, so we had we had talcum powder out. Like, Kiss, you know. I had uh, Banaka. We used to light the Banaka. <laughs> Growing up in the 70s as a kid, uh, I was addicted to horror movies. I mean, I think we all were back then. Creature Features and all those gothic horror movies from the early 60s and Night of the Living Dead and all that stuff. And then uh, the first time, the first song I ever heard from Black Sabbath was Black Sabbath, the song Black Sabbath. And that was just like all of that incarnated into music. You know? I was like horrified when I heard the first three notes. It was so powerful and so deadly sounding. And it changed me forever. It made me, it made my idea of what was heavy completely changed, you know. That's what really set me on, you know, the path. I could see nothing else. The first time I met Pete Steele was years before that. Carnivore, the drummer of Carnivore, Louis Beto from Carnivore, the drummer, grew up well with my brother. They were all five years older than us. Peter was five years old, older than us. My brother went to school with Louis. Louis was in my house all the time, every day. He heard me on my TV. <laughs> and I was like, wow, you know, your little brother's getting really good. So I guess Stan or whoever was in Carnivore at the time left. I was taking it down to be Pete Steele. Maybe you'll you try out for Carnivore. I was like 14 years. I was this little skinny kid. You know? I weighed like maybe 90 pounds wet. He was like, come meet Peter. So I was like, okay. I went down to one of their shows to meet Peter. And this is when they were wearing the whole, all the, the fur outfits with the, you know, the shoulder pads, and, and he was 90 feet tall, you know, and he walked up to me, he goes, hey, this is Peter, this is, this is Peter's little brother, Kenny. I was like, and he just looked down at me, perplexed, and he went, you got a Marshall stack? I'm like, you got to work out. And he walked away. <laughs> What's it? That was my <laughs> first meeting of Peter. Regardless, I didn't get into Carnival. Would have never figured that I would end up playing with the guy for 30 years after. Our first rehearsal was when it, it, like in the A room in Sal's studio on Quentin Road. Josh came down, it's the first time. Not, well, first time I officially met Josh. I knew him too from back in the day when I was a kid. He was one of the older kids still. And he was just like, full on. <laughs> Hair and everything right off the bat, you know. I remember it was, it was quite chaotic and I just improvised lead wise. Well, first show we did, I think we played a Saturday night. All we had was the first record, right? So it was slow, deep and hard which was 70 minutes of either 100 beats a second or, you know, one beat per minute dirge, you know. And we proceeded to play the whole record. You know, and who showed up? Carnival fans. During the show, we played a Carnival cover and the whole audience broke out into a huge fight and they all ran outside of Lamar and they were all fighting in front of Lamar and the whole club was empty. So we had like 40 minutes left of playing with two people left in the audience. That was the first show. Peter was uh, unique. You know, we were all wanted to be rock stars. Everybody, you know, everybody was put all this effort into that. Pete didn't give a shit about that. He just wanted to play music, make records, and with the least amount of effort and not leave home. He didn't want to leave Brooklyn. We always talk about this, the type of black cloud. No, mm -hmm. it truly is. At that time, Peter was very much, you know, he'd lock himself in the basement and he had his keyboard and his guitar. Pete was getting tired of just screaming, you know. And we were already dabbling with melody, you know. From so deep and hard on, certain things, whoa, 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 things like that, you know. It's way harder to write a melody than just to scream your head off, you know, and we wanted to expand, you know, and start getting some melodic qualities to the band and bring it to another level. A lot of it was, um, most of it, much of it was pre-written. I didn't realize what it was. That's, that's the honest answer is, I didn't realize that it was gonna be 
you know, in any way uh, groundbreaking or anything like that. Uh, it was a long period, about a year. The album was done. It was delivered. It was, it hit the streets. And we were dead in the water when we were doing it. It took us at least a year. I think the album was out a year before we even went on the road, before we could convince Peter to go on the road. And at that point, we took off in a bus and we just played small clubs across America. You know, we had the greatest time of our lives. And it was always the feeling of, okay, this is it. The last hurrah. This band is over after this. You know, he's never going to get on the bus again. You know, whatever. It's going to be another disaster. And then we got a call from um, Nine Inch Nails. Right. So Trent liked the man. He cited the first record as some of his influences and asked us to come out and open up for Nine Inch Nails for two weeks, the first two weeks of their tour on the uh, West Coast. We jumped in a truck and van and drove straight from Brooklyn right to Seattle. It would prove that Typo could basically open up for any band. We'd have a song that could fit in with any band, you know, except Nine Inch Nails at the height of, of their up where they were hot, you know. Oh my God, we got shit thrown at us every night. They hated us, we were doing metal. So we were, we're gonna, that's it. This this two weeks is gonna break the band, we're gonna be superstars, we get there, people throwing stuff at us. <laughs> Peter's finally like, you're gonna throw anything, throw money. Change, change, like tons of change. We were only there for two weeks. And then another thing where Tommy Lee and, and uh, guys from Motley Crue were making their record with Karabi at the time and they liked the band. They were playing the band in their control room while they were making that record. So they asked us to come out with them. This is probably 95 I'm thinking. Motley Crue? How are we gonna play with Motley Crue? Forget it. We just got off the whole Nine Inch Nails experience. You know what I mean? It's like we're gonna get shit thrown at us. You know we listened to it. We took the tour. It was a summer shed tour. All outdoor sheds. Arenas. And we had nothing to lose, and my manager was right. Within the first week, we were selling like 2,000 records a week, which was like, we sold 50 albums a week before that. That's what started the ball. Motley Crue. Christian Wu was the first one that really broke as a radio single. But Black Number One, previous to that, that was the first release, right, I believe. And that was on Headbangers Ball. At that time, we were getting the airplay on Headbangers Ball, so if you're playing heavy music, you, you would, on Beavis and Butthead, the Headbangers Ball. So Black Number One was getting some regular rotation with that. And at that time, your career was being judged and christened or allowed by two cartoon characters named Beavis and Butthead. If they liked you, you were in. If they went, your career was over. You're a lot of bands, they were out of there. Of course, the Beavis and Butthead, which is scary, but they like they liked Black Number One. So that started the radio ball going, you know, singing Black Number One, doing the whole, that was the first time, like, I mean, me and Peter were doing kind of duet stuff with Hey P, which was one of my other favorite moments. That kind of like started it with me and him go back and forth, and then Black Number One really solidified it, you know. And it was really a lot of fun. Discovered, because I was not a singer. Up to that point, I just played guitar, you know. It just happened to be that, like, my voice complimented him. He had this deep baritone, you know, like the opposite. There was always tension between Peter and uh, Josh, and I uh, points me and Josh. It's difficult to live together, man, especially with four strong personalities. You know, they all want their way. You know, everybody's trying to make a name and a mark for themselves, you know. Everybody's in competition with each other. I guess that's part of what makes it good, too. It makes it work. Well, unfortunately, uh, in the October rust, period, drugs came involved. That started a down, down, downhill spiral out know, for both me and Peter. Me more rapidly than him. So, you know, coming off of all of that, the album didn't sell as many as they wanted. They wanted us to sell 80 million records. We didn't, you know, it eventually went flat. I kind of trying to push the direction of the band to a more realistic approach. It's got more realism. All right, enough with the vampires. Enough with the, you know, the romantic candlelight. Let's talk about the truth. Like we didn't so deep and hard. Let's go back to that. So that's what the album was about. It was about, you know, addiction, death. Peter just lost his father. We were all addicted to something. You know, darker times, darker record. It's hard to listen to. You know. It was very, very challenging. Uh, you know, it was hard to get 
Peter to work a full day, he would disappear a lot. By then, it just, it, all those elements just got worse. By the time Life is Killing Me was like pulling teeth, this album's killing me. Took forever. Um, most of it developed, all of it developed in the, now all of it had to be developed in the rehearsal studio. He would come down with no riffs, you know. Just a lot of booze, <laughs> wine, and his bass. And uh, we, we had to basically work the album live together, you know. Well, that show was um, at Harpo's in Detroit. In 2009, uh, Halloween night, we didn't know it was the last show, of course. We all got in the bus, went home right after that. We sang songs and partied all the way to Brooklyn, had a great time. You know, just not knowing that was going to be the last time. You were chasing a bone, you know, for 40 years of your life, you know. You're chasing the same carrot. Him dangling the carrot, you know. You get tired, you get tired of it. Him dying like that was, uh, you know, earth shattering. So, you know, I guess, you know, for, for a good long time I did, I lost the desire to keep chasing it. I call it chasing the ghost. People become casualties of it. Yeah. Peter was a casualty of it. If we didn't talk him into leaving Brooklyn, he would have never died like that. He would have never died that young. I don't think so. Oh, he was a very complicated person, so I can't, you know, I, it's not going to be in one statement. You can't, like, break him down into anything concise. But he was another one. He was chasing the ghost, too, you know. I think in the end, uh, essentially, he was lonely. I think the band, in the end, has substance, you know. It has, it's unique. And I think new generations are discovering it, and they do. It hopefully, we made something that's going to last, you know, a couple more generations. And transcend, it's transcending. I miss the tour, the playing every night with my friends. Playing music with my friends every night and getting off stage and dying laughing every night till two in the morning. That's what I miss. Most important thing uh, is my wife and my daughters and maintaining musical integrity and doing what I want to do musically. Not selling any more pieces of myself away and leaving some, leaving my legacy, whatever my legacy is going to be. I'm going to keep working on that till the day I freaking croak. I hope that my legacy will be one of honesty, you know, in the writing, in the music itself. But to me, that's the most rewarding thing. I mean, one thing about Type O fans, you know, either you hate us or, you know, they're crazy about us, you know. All this dark stuff we wrote about, and a lot of funny stuff, it's where we are a healing element in their lives. You know, when people talk to you and it, the fans, they're, they're honest. I mean, they mean a positive thing when they, when they speak about the band and how it influenced them, you know. So to be uh, a healing factor in their lives is a great, a rewarding thing. John, we got to talk about the two record. Yeah, the two record. Yes. Tell us how. Tell us how that came about. You know, the two record came about from I was working with Rudy Sarzo, and Rudy introduced me to Bob Marlette. Mm. Somehow, I think Rob Halford got a hold of Bob Marlette. They were talking, and said, "Oh, you should meet John Lowry, who is uh, you know this guitar player." And we got together. I, I, rem, I remember flying out to meet Halford. We lived in uh, Phoenix. And whenever I fly, I always like to have a Reese's peanut butter cup. Sometimes you can't find the Reese's peanut butter cup unless there's four of them. J5 didn't want four of them. So I ate two and I put the other two in my pocket. <laughs> so I go to Halford's in Phoenix. It's about 194 degrees there. <laughs> I and I'm not joking. This is a true story. I sit down and he had a white uh, oh, couch, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting on his couch and he's like, Johnny, you know, you know, this is great, and we're gonna do this and we're gonna do that, and I'm like, yeah, 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 this is great. And while he's talking to me, I was like, oh no, the Reese's peanut butter cup is in my pocket, opened. So I'm sitting and he said. 
would you like something to drink? And I said, you know, most of the time you say, I'm good. No, and I said, absolutely. <laughs> so he left. I got up, looked on the sofa. It's terrible. It <laughs> looks like someone had an accident all over. So what did I do? And this is true. You can ask Halford about this. I'm like, yeah, yeah, lemonade's great. I take the cushion, turn it upside down, push it, yeah. and just stood the rest of the day. Yeah. And it worked amazing. And sure enough, Halford found this like a year later or something like that. <laughs> and uh, that record was, it was so weird because all these things started to happen. Like Tom Morello was like, oh, this is great. You know, he heard it and this one Rage was you know, they put out their first record and it was like, they were like, oh, Tom, I remember Tom Morello really liking this. And Trent Reznor uh, produced the record and I was like, whoa, this is like something very special, but it was different from Judas Priest or anything like that. So and yeah. it was really great songs. And we did a lot of really cool shows. We played at the Palace right on Vine Street here in LA with Rammstein came in on fire you know and and I was like we did a lot of really cool shows like that wow. and I think that band would have kept going but I got a chance to join Marilyn Manson and Rob was getting back to the Judas Priest and we kind of just went like this but we w made one great record but we never had we always had so much fun you know it was just the best of times all the time so uh it was it was a it was a gr it was very successful except for the cushion. <laughs> you're, I was thinking you're so lucky that it was the same on the bottom as it was on the top. I know. Yeah. <laughs> it, and it's it's a true story. And I was so it was like a movie. It was like a movie because I was like, you know, you know. And uh, did you ever tell him? By the way, Rob. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And he was like, he goes, uh, I swear, he goes, I was wondering what happened. I thought it was one of the cats. <laughs> yeah. I think that record may have been the first record that I got where I discovered you. Yeah. And one of the, one of the cool things I remember, I guess I was at the age where I kind of thought Judas Priest was Judas Priest and Iron Maiden was Iron Maiden. Sure. Nothing changed. Right. That was such a great moment in music history, but in metal history specifically, where someone could reinvent themselves yeah. and surround themselves with different musicians playing aggressive music, but playing it differently. Yeah. And I found that so inspiring and I love that record. Thank you, thank you. Tell me about how David Lee Roth came into your life and what, <clears throat> what that meant. That was, you know, Van Halen, just like all of us were our heroes and larger than life and and just untouchable if you will yeah and they you know you rarely hear even nowadays people going oh yeah i met david lee roth or i met eddie van halen because they were literally untouchable and i remember i was sitting on my friend's couch and it was so primitive it was so like elementary and i looked at dave's book and i was like hmm i wonder what Dave is doing now. And there was a little address and phone number that I found. And I called and I said, Hey, are you guys looking for songs? I mean, I, I still do that today. I like go out on a limb and just make crazy phone calls. He goes, well, yeah, you can um, send a tape to, you know, this address or a CD or something like that. And I was like, Oh my God, this is wonderful. I scrounged up what little money I had I, from the help of Bob Marlette. And we did three songs and I sent it to the office. I couldn't believe it, but I got a phone call and they said, hey, Dave likes those songs, can you send three more? Going into the studio was very expensive back then. It was like really expensive. And Bob did me another favor and said, okay, you know, we'll do three more. And they get those and they call and they said, Dave really likes th these three as well. So we had a total of six, can you do three more? And I said, Mr. Anderson, I can't, I'm sorry. I just don't have any money. And he goes, okay, well, let me call you right back. So he calls back and he goes, <laughs> Dave wants you to come to the house. So I was like, oh my God, you know, and me being a Van Halen nut, I knew this is where they did, they rehearsed. This is where they did all their pictures. 
this is where they did the Pretty Woman video. And I knew the house. And they were like, here's the address. I didn't want to say, I know the address, you know. I remember pressing the thing and then going, oh, I'm here to see Dave and go up the driveway. And the driveway is all messed up. And I see the Panama car and I see the, the Panama motorcycle with the horns. And I see Dave and he goes, John, nice to meet you. And I was like, I couldn't believe it. You know, it's like my hero. And he goes, we're going to make a record and we're going to do it just like the Van Halen days. We're going to do it live. And, you know, this is when we're going to do it. And I said, uh, Mr. Roth, I'm rehearsing with Rob Halford for a tour. And he goes, all right, well, that's great. And what we're going to do then, because I don't want you tired after rehearsal. We're going to do it at 6 a.m. at the studio. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm going to be really tired at 6 a.m. <laughs> but uh, I remember going into the studio, 6 a.m., like so nervous. Like, here's David Lee Roth, and we're about to, like, do a downbeat, you know? He said, if you can't do it in two takes, you can't do it. So I was, like, really nervous. <laughs> and so I did it. I was just like, I just practiced and practiced at home all these songs perfectly. And we just made this record, DLR Band. And Ray Luzier, who yeah. now plays in Corn, was playing drums. And it's really something special. And just, I'm very honored to have made music with him and be his friend. Is, uh, is there anybody that you didn't get to see? Lies. Oh, yeah, really. Never, just never. Yeah. Wow. I did see, I saw Jimi Hendrix on his uh, Are You Experienced tour wow. in Chicago at the Oriental Theater back in 67, maybe. Oh, yeah. my God. And the the opening band was Soft Machine. <laughs> Remember that? One? No. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but that was when, like, the DJ host, you know, came out with, gla with you yeah. know, glasses and a Nehru jacket and a big, like, <laughs> gold medallion. And, you know, but with a, you know, a, 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 like a normal haircut. And I remember him saying, OK, kids, please, you know, uh, put out the cigarettes. The uh, the fire, the fire marshal is, you know, seen there. You know, shouldn't it shouldn't smoke in the theater. And then he went off stage. Everybody's booing him. And he went off stage. The curtain's still down. And you hear this voice that says, put out them cigarettes. Nobody burns a place down but Jimmy. And everybody's like, oh. And then you start hearing the, the music and... And you hear this amazing guitar riff yeah. as the curtain rises and it's, it's still dark. And then as the light goes on, you see Jimmy is playing this riff, holding his guitar out in one hand, just playing the neck and just playing this amazing riff. And we're all like, oh my oh, God. Wow, that's so that was, cool. yeah, anyway, so. Wow. And you'd see Jimmy. What an amazing story. <laughs> yeah, it was. yeah, that's incredible. Jeez Louise. If you could make a record with anybody, alive or dead, who is it and what would it be? You know, <clears throat> I've had so many wonderful opportunities and made so many great records with my heroes. I think that, I mean, anything that comes along, I'm so happy. I'm so appreciative, you know, and I always said um, Prince, and I had, you know, I love Prince just like every everyone else, but the reason I say Prince is because I had an opportunity to go work with Prince, and um, his guitar tech said, oh, I don't know if you call him Prince, but he said, hey, you should check out this guitar player, his name is John Five, and blah, 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 blah. He called me the guitar tech and said, hey, if this number comes up, he's going to call you. You got to pick it up. And this is when we first got cell phones. And I was just starting the Hollywood album, Marilyn Manson. And I'm in the studio and I have my brand new cell phone and I have it right here. And there comes the Minneapolis number. And I ran outside and hello. And, and I heard what's happening and it was, I was like oh man this is great and he goes i want you to come down to paisley park and you know do some work and i was just listening listening i was just i couldn't believe it and but i just started this record you know i just started it and it's something you just can't do is you just can't like just get up and go so i said i would love to and i'll do it 
as soon as I'm done with this record or as soon as I have a break, I'm there. And, you know, we talked and then that was it. But um, he never called again. So that's why I always said Prince, you know, because I was almost there to make that uh, yeah. to make that record. But at least I got a chance to talk to him. Nobody ever really goes away. Right. Especially when you're, you know, long after you two are gone, we're going to have so much to remember you both by. Be like, oh, I remember when he played this part. Remember when he made that record with yeah. that guy? That's I, I know my daughters would probably go, oh, <laughs> <laughs> enough. <laughs> I found this chop top yeah, costume. Right, yeah, in the garage. Yeah, yeah. I found this hanger. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, let's just bend it and put a, put a shirt on it. Whose cape is this? Yeah. <laughs> right. And with that, I'd like to thank Bill and John for being here on this very, very special episode of Metal and Monsters. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you guys for both being the artists that you are, the living legends that you are. It's been an honor to have you guys together. <laughs> All right, metalheads and monster fans, our evening has once again come to a close. I'd like to thank our guests, John Five and Bill Mosley, for visiting with us tonight. How fun was that? And as we're reminded how much we love to celebrate this haunted holiday, remember the spirit of Halloween isn't limited to just one single night. So grab those leather jackets and light those jack-o'-lanterns and gather with your friends. Until next time, have a safe and happy Hallow's Eve. Good night, everyone. You like the four, you like chaos. What makes you think this? Is-